We're in these closing words in chapter 4, these closing thoughts of the Apostle Paul, and he's giving commendations. He's giving these expressions of love and honor to his various helpers, various men in the faith that were laborers, gospel laborers with him. Uh, just reminding us what we're coming back to. It's been a few weeks. <clears throat> and so they're, they're just overflowing with truths about Christian labor, Christian closeness, brotherhood. Last time, we picked up with Tychicus. Now, just a quick question. There's what, nine of you ladies with child? How many of you are going to have sons? Anybody know yet? Tychicus is a consideration in your name list. <laughs> And Aristarchus, or if you would prefer Aristarchus, but you get the point. Tychicus was a faithful brother. Paul gave him the letters to Colossians, to the Colossian Christians and the Ephesian Christians. You don't just hand a letter like that to anybody. And Tychicus gave words of comfort or expressions to those Christians as a messenger from Paul. So Tychicus was a faithful brother. But today we're going to go on with three more men that Paul mentions. And he gives the same kinds of heartfelt commendation. What a, what a love he had for these men. And what, what we should see in our very narrow glimpse, we should love them and learn from them. Go to the text, Colossians 4, pick it up, verse 10. And we're going to look at 10 and 11 today. Paul says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, salutes you or sends his greetings. And Mark, the sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom you received commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. Greeting. Verse 11. And Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision, meaning all three of these men, who are of the circumcision, they're Jewish, had been born Jewish. These only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, or for the kingdom of God, as it says in the ESV which have been a comfort unto me. Let's pray. Father, thank you again that you've given us these, these words, these verses, these commendations, these glimpses into the life of your servants. So many of them that we just barely understand what they were about, but yet you raised them up. And they were close. They were examples for us. They walked with Christ Jesus, the great one, the savior of the world. They walked together, they loved him, they preached him, they prayed to him, they sang to him, they wept before you. So give us grace now to see and behold from your word precious truths for our lives. Help us, Lord. Teach us, draw us for your glory. Amen. A fellow servant, a devoted brother, someone who sticks by you. It's a blessing, isn't it? Any of those three, somebody who's a servant with you, somebody who's devoted to you, or somebody who just sticks with you, I mean, through the, the good and the bad. What a blessing. What a gift of God. I wanted to quote Proverbs 17, 17, just as a part of the beginning today. A friend loveth at all times. What's the second part of that? And a brother is born for adversity. So those who'll stick by you, what a blessing. It is such a significant part of the Christian life together. We together, not just laborers in the gospel, but every Christian to have fellow servants or laborers or friends, bonded ones. And as I emphasized last time, as we're coming into these closing verses, Paul was not a solo act. The gospel didn't have only him out there advancing it. The gospel treasury, if you want to call it, the treasure of the gospel was not just Paul's to advance. He was not in it by himself. He had helpers. He had companions. He had friends. He had men who were pillars in their own way. And sisters in the faith, obviously. We see glimpses into them. So Paul was not turning the world upside down with the gospel by himself. <laughs> there were others the Lord Jesus Christ gave him, the Lord Jesus Christ gave him faithful brothers for the ongoing gospel labor. That's what he's always done. He is in Christ. He has his people today and forever in every country at every season throughout 
the end of the world. That's Christ building his church. And so Paul had these men, he had these ones like Tychicus. And here we come into these three men today. They were faithful men. They were true fellow laborers with him. And all of these laborers, beloved, all of these ones here and today with us and our fellow Christians throughout the earth, they're necessary. We're necessary to each other. We're, we're connected. The expansion of the gospel in the first century depended upon this network, this organic people with one cause, one gospel truth, one proclamation, Christ Jesus and him crucified, raised and ascended on high. So do we. The expansion of the gospel and the purity of the gospel in our day depends on all of us faithfully laboring in it, living it, speaking it, and strengthening one another in the very truth. So Paul would say that these fellow brothers were indispensable. That's a fair, he would say that. He is saying it in his own way. And they were, and they still are. I told you early on that uh, I don't want to just go through Scripture as a history lesson, though it is history. We want it to shape us and change us and refine us and speak to us. These last 11 verses of Colossians are a beautiful record of such dear, devoted men, brethren, ones we're going to see in heaven. You might, one of you ladies one day in, in the eternal kingdom of God, you may say to Tychicus, Brother Philip said we might ought to name a son after you. That's hard to even comprehend. Would we say that to fellow Christians in heaven? Perhaps, and much more as we talk on the things of his kingdom and his glory. So verse, these 11 verses that we're coming to, I, I don't want to just breeze through them. I'd already warned you. I warned Brother Jeff several weeks ago. I'm not just going to whoop through these. Kevin and Sherry and I were together on Friday, and we were talking about Tychicus. And we were, I said, I just can't just read them as though we're just going to close out the book, and it's over. There's something that Paul's giving us. It's all the Word of God. It's truth, and it's helpful, and it's good for our edification and being built up. I want you to behold wonderful things about God's servants, about true Christians and how they labored and how they, they were with each other. I want us to learn. I'm learning as I go through these. So much so that as we look at their lives, our lives are shaped or impacted. We obviously feel that about the Apostle Paul. Who wouldn't <laughs> that's a Christian that reads the Bible? But we want to see these others. We want to understand what, what nuggets of truth that we have. So today, three men. I might, this might be the only sermon you ever hear on this side of glory, right? About Aristarchus and Mark and Justice. But hang with me. Stay with me. May God teach us. May our Savior shepherd us. They're all fellow servants. And they were devoted and true to the Apostle Paul to the end. That right there ought to speak to us, right? All right. Some brief history. I'm not a great historian, so... Hang in there. There's not a whole lot of text on uh, each of them, but there's plenty for us to, to see. But let, who are these men? Nick? Brian? Who is Aristarchus? Michelle? Anybody want to give me a download on Aristarchus? We don't go around and talk about Aristarchus, do we? We know about Mark because he wrote the, the second gospel. This justice one, we, we really don't know essentially anything about him. But let me just give you some quick uh, overview from the text, and then we'll see why Paul gives this commendation of these godly ones. Aristarchus, Jewish by birth, each of the three of them were. They were Jews that were converted into Christ Jesus. They were no longer in Judaism, they were in Christ. But we know that when we look at Aristarchus, he's mentioned five times in the New Testament. Three times in the book of Acts, here in the book of Colossians, or the letter to the Colossian Christians, and in Paul's brief letter to Philemon. Aristarchus is mentioned five times. You remember Tychicus was mentioned five times in the New Testament. It's worth just seeing each of those on your own time. Aristarchus was a Macedonian. He was born in Thessalonica. It gives us at least, where did he grow up in? Not Rome, and not other places, but he was born in Thessalonica. And Aristarchus, as we pick it up and we see him come on the scene in the book of Acts, he became a loyal companion to the Apostle Paul. That's, that's clearly, I mean, once he was connected, once he was in Christ and he was connected to Paul, he's there. He's, he's tied in. You can't miss it. And he traveled with him through Macedonia, Greece, Asia, and eventually to Rome. This Aristarchus, this brother, 
Rami and Michael and these brothers who do a lot of travel, you, you can enjoy this in, a, in ways that some of us can't, honestly. Rami, good grief. The guy, where is Brother Rami? I, mean, I got to see a hand go up. Is he here or did he have to take the children? Anyway, okay. But you talk about travels. Sometimes Rami's sharing, I'm thinking, well, I've been all over the Metroplex this week. <laughs> I mean, all over the Metroplex, and that guy's been halfway around the world and back. But Aristarchus was connected to Paul as a loyal companion. He traveled with him. He labored with him. He was, he was bonded with him in, in what they were about. And brothers and sisters, these were not glamour trips, and I'm not implying that Michael's or anybody else's are. But think of the day we're talking about. We're talking about the gospel going across the world. We're going to use that in terms of a manner of speech into lands and countries and places where there was opposition, hostility, threats, and eventually killings and tortures. So we're not talking about glamour trips, right? There were no fine hotels and fine dinners. I've appreciated years past Piper saying, you know, we go to our conferences and they're all plush and everything's so refined and nobody suffers for anything being there. It's really a true statement. But the point is, this companionship and these travels by Aristarchus were, were with Paul in difficult days. These missionary journeys included being a companion to very hazardous conditions. There were dangers. So you didn't just sign up casually. You weren't just saying, I'm going to be joined to Paul without having to count the cost. It's real. Aristarchus, for, for example, Aristarchus was seized, apprehended by the mob in Ephesus, which we see back in Acts 19. Go back and read it today. I mean, things got stirred up. The crowd got angry. And they, they apprehended these men. They took them by force. Aristarchus, right there. He was part of it. He got apprehended. So it's, it was rough, these were, these were men who were on the front edge of the gospel advancement in first century times. But Paul honors pa this brother, this Aristarchus, and calls him a fellow prisoner, a fellow prisoner with him. Yes, beloved, Aristarchus volunteered to share in Paul's imprisonment in Rome. What do I mean by that? Aristarchus was not kept in the same way that Paul was. Aristarchus went in and out, apparently, in different capacities to minister to the Apostle Paul. What a picture. What, what scenes must have that been like of Aristarchus and other men, but others who could come in, they were allowed at times, Paul could have ministry to his needs through others that cared for him. And Aristarchus was one of them, a faithful one. And so he would take things and he would be with Paul and... My, oh, my, what those moments and days and hours must have been. So truly, as we think about Aristarchus, he was a brother born for adversity. He was there. He was with Paul. He helped him. I'm just setting some history. We're going to get to the three things that Paul says about him here in a minute. Second, John Mark, or what we know as Mark, called here by Paul. Paul wrote the second gospel. So we're talking about a man of the scriptures, right, who wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He, he was a writer, but here we have him as a companion or a fellow helper, a laborer with Paul. He was with him. But he was also the cousin of Barnabas. So we could, we could go off and t chase this for a little bit. This will make us appreciate why in that whole scene that where there was the, the conflict, right, where it, it pamphlet, Pamphylia, Mark ended up staying or departed from Paul and there was harsh words between Paul and Barnabas, right? That's what you're thinking. You probably remember that, but this is the same man. He's the cousin of Barnabas. Mark is. And yes, he was a writer of the scriptures. So he's not, a, he's not a, just a tag on guy. He is a significant New Testament man. The gospel of Mark that he wrote. But we're, in, we're inclined to think negatively of him oftentimes because of the scene that happened in Acts 15, which I'm alluding to where he and Paul and then Paul and Barnabas, there was, there was a breaking apart. And so that is part of the history of this man, John Mark. But here, we're roughly 12 years later. All of that, beloved, has been reconciled. It's done. Whatever had happened, and Max spoke 
about the life of Jacob at our men's retreat a week ago. Whatever had happened in that time, God had taken him on. And he was dear, I'm talking about Mark, to the Apostle Paul. This is very significant to us to realize what Paul is saying here. Otherwise, we might read this and forget, wow, huge things, whatever had happened, had been healed by the grace of the Holy Spirit. And so now Paul not only commends him, as we're going to see, but he, he has such love and respect for him that he says to the Colossians that if he comes to you, receive him. Right? Receive him. There's been some times in the last 25 years where I've gone places where Mac didn't go. Write that down, Linda. A few. <laughs> A few. And I go, and I, I meet brothers, I meet men, I meet tremendous men of sometimes, and I'm that other guy. I just tell them who I am, and I know Brother Mac. And so, when I, and they receive me, because they know him. <laughs> they receive me. Bill McLeod is one of those stories, when he was in Louisville 15, 20 years ago. And Bill McLeod is in glory now, but Mac and Charles and those other men, Ian would know who I'm talking about, they, they talked about him, and I finally got to go meet him. I just showed up at a little church in Louisville one Sunday afternoon, and I got there an hour and a half early or something, Brian. Incredible. I walk in. It's like, where is everybody? And somebody saw me just standing in the little sanctuary and said, what are you here for? I said, I'm here to see Bill McLeod if I can. And they said, well, he's, he's just back by himself here in the parlor. <laughs> Wasn't expecting I'd have a one-on-one -on -one with him in the parlor. He took me in there. He just loved me and let me share, and we talked. But the point is, Paul's saying about his, his beloved friend and companion Mark, receiving, okay? So we, we realize whatever had been there, God has made them, brought them in unity and their, their common bond in Christ and in the kingdom. So also, we can glean from the text that Mark also <clears throat> would go in at times and minister to the Apostle Paul in the prison, he would help. He would do things. And so that seems to be a part of the, the, the relationship that Mark had ongoing in these latter days, latter years of Paul's life. Third, justice. The common name among Jews was Jesus, but they would, he was called justice. We, we hardly if, know anything. This name appears, but you cannot cross-reference this to a lot of other things in the New Testament. But he's another fellow worker of Paul's. Clearly, he's in this companionship and these men of faithfulness that you would absolutely count your life with him. Or as Paul might say, that guy will take a bullet for me. That guy will stand with me no matter what. And justice is one of those men. He is very possibly, you'll see different writers take different positions, very possibly he's that man that was in Corinth where we come in Acts 18, and there's an uprising. Like I said, you're going to hang out with Paul. It's just not going to be a carnival. It's not just going to be book signings and glamorous lights and hotels and conferences. Paul, I mean, we're talking about the front edge of the battle of the gospel. And here, justice, if he's the one, is, is he, again, he was, he was born Jewish. He's a Christian. And Paul is brought into a man's house named Justice. It very could, it very could, could be him. We don't know. But he was a man that, at that picture or that scene in Acts 18, helped Paul. So we'll leave it at that. But he's a fellow worker with the Apostle Paul. So that gives us a quick look at the three companions, these three fellow servants of Paul. But what does Paul say about them? Rami was teaching in the Bible study hour of the book of Jude. And the things he said about those men, evil men in the latter days, is the antithesis of what we're going to see here. Rami was dealing with three things that were evil. We're going to deal with three things that are beautiful in the Christian life together. There are noteworthy qualities, beloved, that I want you to see that marked him. This is, this is masculine and feminine. This is for any of us who are Christians. This is for you sisters as much as it is for us as brothers. This is about the Christian life and the bond that we have. I don't want you to ever see, sing blessed be the tie that binds again without thinking of some of these truths. Let it elevate our thoughts of what it means to have each other. First, their loyalty to Paul. Look back at the text. Their loyalty. We're going to come back and look at this here in verse 11. Stay with me. These are Jewish Christians, these three men. The next three that Paul's going to get to 
are Gentile Christians. These are Jewish men that are Christians. And Paul has now this loyalty that he commends them, their loyalty to him. Because the contrast is that most Jews did what with the Apostle Paul? They rejected the gospel. I mean, Paul was a Jew, right? He was the leader. He was, in terms of his scholarship and his his anti-Christianity mindset, and now Paul is the leading force in the Christian movement, and here are these men loyal to him. They were Jews, now they're Christians, and they're tied into Paul. So most Jews, which would have meant their countrymen, their people, I'm talking about the, the extended people of Aristarchus and Mark and Justice were Jews, and they hated the gospel. I'm talking in generalities. There was still such opposition. Yes, there were Jews that were converted, but the general ongoing uh, history of the gospel going forth in the gospels is now it goes to the Gentiles because the Jews rejected the Messiah. But here are these men that are loyal. We read that, we may not even give a second thought to what you're talking about being loyal to. It's one thing to be loyal to your comrades in war, and that is a powerful picture for us. But we're talking about men who are loyal to Paul in the intensity of opposition against the gospel. They stuck by Paul in these difficult days, in these battles for the truth. The ESV actually says in verse 11 that these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers. The King James says, who are of the circumcision? What is Paul emphasizing? These are the men called out of the Jewish life, Jewish law, Jewish death, and brought into the kingdom of Jesus Christ, and they are my fellow workers. He says, these only. These are the only men. Now, they're not the only Jews that were converted that supported Paul, but he's emphasizing something very powerful. Loyalty to Paul, loyalty to the gospel, in spite of their countrymen, their people, hating it. Big. This is big, beloved. Consider this, as I've already been saying. The Jews hated the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to use that. That is the right word. It's not that they, they questioned him. It's not that they thought, well, we'll, we'll consider this for a while. Let's, let's, let's run out 10 or 30 or 50 years. They hated him. They had him crucified. They rose up against the Messiah, our great Savior, and crucified him. Right? So we're talking great hostility. So the Jews now hated Paul, put yourself in this picture now. If you're Aristarchus or you're Mark or you're Justice, you're a part of those that would hate you, meaning you're to be hated. So if you're going to join in Paul in advancing the gospel, you're not going to be going down a smooth journey. You're going to deal with people of your own type, at least how you grew up and what you're around, who now question everything that you're about. They're going to be against you. There's this, now this conflict that's built in. We must remember, loyalty in that day was something that you would put your life at risk for each other on. Incredible picture here. Because the Jewish people despised and opposed such loyalty. Any loyalty to the gospel of Jesus Christ was going to create difficulty, challenges and opposition, threats. I mean, we read of what happened to Paul. So these three men, Aristarchus and Mark and Justice, They had put off Judaism, and they had put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, where's their loyalty? The gospel that Paul was preaching and advancing. Their loyalty was to Paul. The first thing he commends them for as Jews of the circumcision, that they are with me. They're my fellow workers. Wow. It's big. It's glorious. So that loyalty is for us to learn from. How about us? How about us? What about you? Do you have the loyalty to stand by fellow Christians in the face of opposition? What will it cost you and I to stand by brothers and sisters in the faith? It's a fair question. It's important for us to think this way. Do we have the loyalty to stand by fellow Christians in the face of opposition? As these brothers did is we're learning from them. We're learning about living the Christian life. Let me ask it a few other ways. Will you stand with other Christians despite family criticism? Have you ever had extended family members of yours ask you and criticize you, why do you hang out with so-and-so? Why are you involved in that? 
I don't, who is that guy? Who are those families? Have you ever had that? I mean, it seems like you could select others. I mean, your parents or people that in the extended family sometimes look at Christians, look at you, look at other Christians that through the ages, and they go, I, I, I thought I taught you to be like this. And, and what are you doing being with those kinds of people? I mean, those people don't look real set on big things about men, money and power and fame. And Come on, I taught you to be more than that. Is that a fair assessment? It happens. It happens. Why did you marry so-and-so? They're a Christian? You see, beloved, we, when we net this out and we put it into our Christian life, it, it's real. It's real to us. Do we, do we stand? Are we loyal to each other? In, in Christ, in the truth. Another way of asking, will you pursue Christian friendships at work in spite of the company hierarchy? Oh, man, you can't do that, right? Oh, you're slotted where you're slotted in your work, and, and don't you dare in any other level of where you're working start relating to Christians. And yet Christians do it all the time. It's such, a, it's such a wonderful reality or experience in you, different ones, different ages, and different places. You know what I'm saying. To have true Christians that you're around in your work. The society says, why don't you just keep your little package separate and you just do that on the weekend. You see, when you think about these men that stood with Paul, they had way more than we would ever imagine in terms of resistance and criticism, hostility. And yet, to stand with somebody at work, to love somebody, to, to build a friendship with them can just be a natural, wonderful thing for you and them. Be sensitive to that. Be ready for that. But be, be willing to count the cost at times. I told you all months and months ago that early in my career, I, I became friends with a guy that was in our print shop where they would run the prints and they would run that offset printer and print specification books and all kinds. And I developed a friendship. And he and I would hang out at lunch and sit outside under the parking, under the building, and we would fellowship and we'd have a Bible. And different principals in the firm would drive by and they would see Philip sitting with this guy. And you could just see on their face, what are you doing with him? Enjoying true fellowship. Just enjoying the truth. I mean, I, I felt it. You, we could, I said, we could, we could go around the room. This thing of loyalty to other Christians, beloved, it is precious you need this. We need this. It's, it's, it's real in the Christian life. Let me ask you another one. <laughs> Will you be joined with Christ's church more than any other group in the world? <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that what others, family, friends, people around, is that, is that what they see in your life? Man, they are committed to that group. I mean, you guys don't even have a building, right? Right? Come on, you're not legit, Joel and Laura, you're not legit. People think that, they say it. We don't, we don't have to be, have wrong attitudes towards people, but what are we connected to? A living people. What were, what were Aristarchus and Mark and Justice connected to? A living Savior with a living people. They weren't building buildings. And sometimes we build buildings, we have to. I understand that, Christians throughout the centuries. But I'm saying, what are they really about? The kingdom. <laughs> Oh, man. And so, are you willing in your giving of yourself, being here, us being connected, are we willing to be seen as that we're loyal, we're locked in with each other? Oh, that's just, right there is enough for us to go away today and say, I need more of that. If you come one day and you, we see each other in our workplace and we took you through the company or wherever you are and you introduce other Christians, would that be precious to them and to, and to you? I hope so. I hope so. So these three companions of Paul had that kind of loyalty. They had absolute life commitment to each other and they were commended by God for it. It's not a small thing. That's the first quality. Their loyalty they were his fellow workers, Jews who had become Christians who were willing to count the cost and be loyal to Paul. Second, they were laborers for the kingdom of God. Look at the text. These only are my fellow workers 
unto or for the kingdom of God. I want to read through that too quickly, what he's saying. These brothers that walked with Paul, that lived it out, were wholeheartedly given to, given to furthering or advancing the kingdom of God. They weren't, they weren't just writing some blogs and some postings every now and then. Read into that whatever you want. They were, on the, they were with him. They, they were with him in spirit and in labor and in harsh things and difficulties. They were, they were with him because they wanted the kingdom of God to go for, right? He says they were my fellow workers for or devoted to the kingdom of God. Now plainly said, what is that? What is this kingdom of God? Plainly said, they were hazarding their lives for the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were taking the glorious gospel that Jesus had given in his life and in his teaching and his resurrection, and they were taking that truth and they were advancing it forward with Paul. They were about the kingdom of God. Paul didn't just say they were secondary in it, they were about it. They, they were my workers. I mean, they were given tasks, they had responsibilities, they were in it. They didn't just stand by on the sidelines or stand on the outside looking in. They were in the work. They were very, very faithful in it. I like how one man put it. They were Jesus' co-laborers. <laughs> you have to, we, have to, we have to read that properly. They were co-laborers for the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, that's what Paul was, right? Yeah, that's what Paul was. A great one, one that we love and admire, but so were these men. They were co-laborers. So is Rami when he gets on the airplane, and so is Michael or Lee when they go with him, and so are the other men, wherever Mac may be. They're laborers with other men. We're strengthening one another's hands in God. We're about the kingdom. It's bigger than us. <laughs> so it's, it's, it was before us and it's after us. Does that make sense? Does that make somebody feel small? Well, that's probably Okay. We're, we're small in ourselves, but the gospel we have is the biggest of all. <laughs> it is the message of the ages. And therefore, that's why our connection to each other is the, the most precious relationship. And I, I'm not diminishing the institution of family, husband and wife and children. That's a separate institution that God's ordained. But we're talking about the body, the one great society in the world. Not what like, madmen like Hitler and all were trying to create, the called out assembly of the Lord Jesus Christ, the kingdom that's what they were about. What a reputation to have. My fellow workers for the kingdom of God. <laughs> mm. What a priority to live by. Did you hear what I said? A priority to live by. What, are the, what shapes the priorities in your life? What shapes what we read, what books we buy? What shapes what we're trying to Share and minister to our children. What shapes what we say to family and friends? What shapes what we do around jury duty? I told the, the elders the story I carried in a commentary a few years ago. Just a hardback commentary. I had, a, I had an attorney really nervous that day because here's a guy sitting there who's been chosen, perhaps, down to the final selection, and he's holding a book, not even the Bible. <laughs> he's looking at that book. But the point is, what, are you, what about the kingdom? What do we do with our up, to, our up time, our down time, whatever? What are we about? We can do it all to the glory of God. We're about advancing the kingdom. We can go have ice cream with our dear wife and be about advancing the kingdom of God if we understand the full ramifications of this. A Christian couple deeply in love in Christ Jesus? Yeah, that ought to preach to people. They ought to ask you about it. What do you have there? We have Christ, <laughs> we have life, we have joy. I was with my little, one of my grandsons last night. We had our time and we're talking, we're sharing. I was telling Krista, oh man, it was just precious to be with him and to press in on him. He's a nine-year-old. What do I want him to live for, right? These men, fellow workers unto the kingdom of God. What about you and I? Can you look at the labor of your life and see it supporting the advancement of the gospel of Christ? You young people that aren't married, you have aspirations and education and what you want to do, and where you want to go and money and things. Can you take it back and look at it and see it tangibly rooted in advancing the kingdom of God? 
I'm not asking anything from you that our great Savior has not already called us to, right? Whatever, men, your career, whatever your skill sets, whatever your brilliance or your weakness or whatever, they are all to be yielded as a living sacrifice to him. It's about the kingdom. Paul had men like that. We have each other in this. It is a fair question. When you buy a car or make big decisions, where is the glory of God in this? Is this about me or is it about him? We, we have to be careful. We can't get bogged down in trying to just lose sight of well, what we're doing. I don't want you at the grocery store bogged down on the aisle about which bread to buy. But you can, you can walk in the spirit and when you look at the total of your life that I'm, I'm living and spending and giving myself to the kingdom of God. That's what, that's what I'm saying. Well, so what about us? When Jeff takes off Fridays for church commitments, which he's done a lot this calendar year, it seems to me, he has a crude time. Jeff doesn't go on golfing outings. He doesn't go climb Mount Everest. Jeff gives his life to the church for you, to, the, to his Savior, to the Word of God, to the people of God. Tommy knows that. Those children know that. He gives it. What, what, do, what do people think about that? Hey, Jeff, how was that ski trip? Uh, that's not what I did on Friday. Hey, hey, Jeff, I bet you caught the best bass in the lake. That's not the fish I was fishing for. You see, you see, beloved, this thing about being about the kingdom of God and how these men with Paul were about the kingdom of God, it is real. It's a testimony to a world around us desperate to be called out of darkness into the marvelous light of Christ Jesus, to have life. Yes, he has a good answer. How do you answer people when they say, weekly prayer meetings, men's studies, and special gatherings with church brethren, boring. Oh, that's got to be miserable. Through the years, different ones I've worked around, but they know Wednesdays, Philip has prayer meetings. So sometimes they feel like the afternoon's getting away, and they're, they're going to lose Philip at some point. But sometimes it can be, just, just one sentence can be said. One opportunity, Jeff and his work, you different men, how Brian runs his business and the different ones, how you testify in just your choices. Yes, people may ask you about weekly prayer meetings or men's studies or the ladies' time or the special gatherings or those Friday night fellowships that we have. What do y'all do? <laughs> we rejoice in Christ and we love one another and grow in Him. It's a pretty good answer. We're, we're about advancing the kingdom of God. Let's not lose sight what we're about, whose we are and what we're about. I'm, I'm preaching to Philip now. I know that, beloved. A lot of Sundays, I'm just looking in a mirror. Y'all are back there somewhere. I know that. Or how about this question when he thinks about the kingdom of God? You mean you wasted your Saturday, a lot of your last Saturday that you had helping some Christians through, th through something? They don't, sometimes they don't say it, they think it. You'll have family members think that. What did you do with your Saturday? Who did y'all load up and move? Oh, man. You move somebody? Well, can't they, can't they move their own stuff? That's what they're thinking at times. But are you stayed at the hospital? I mean, you sisters, man. I, I don't know, men, maybe I'm speaking too uh, comprehensively here, but the sisters put us to shame in this one. Caring for each other, the hurts, the needs, the health issues, hospital scares. I mean, and yet, if people looking from the outside in, like they did in the book of Acts, what were they about, right? And they continued steadfastly in these kinds of things. Breaking bread, prayers, in doctrine, in the truth, being together. Mike and I were having lunch maybe two months ago. Anybody sitting within 10 feet of Michael and I would say, something's going on over there. It looks fun and joyful. And it was. We weren't trying to be stiffs. We were enjoying each other. We were enjoying the truth. And we were enjoying a couple of funny stories about Mac. Just a couple. <laughs> very, very small. We were enjoying because we love him. We were enjoying each other, but we were enjoying the kingdom, to be in the kingdom. We were asking Rami yesterday, tell us where all you've been, who all you've seen. Oh, yeah, and I went here, and then I went... Man, my head was spinning. It was wonderful. So you, are you wasting your life? As Piper would say, are we wasting our lives? If we're about the kingdom, then no. 
The world would look at Aristarchus and Mark and Justice and say, have no interest in them. The Christians look at them and go, I sure would like to know more about them. Yes, beloved, these workers, these men, these servants were with Paul in laboring for the kingdom of God, the glory of the gospel of Christ. And third, let me begin to wind down. Third, they were an encouragement to Paul. And we talked a little bit about this with Tychicus. I mean, Paul is in prison. So he's not hanging out at a nice hotel in downtown Atlanta. He's in prison. He's, he's there under a type of containment that would have not been easy. And yet, Paul says at the end of verse 11, they or these men have been a comfort to me. Is that what it says in the other translations? Does it use that same word? Comfort, ESV or NASB? Any other rendering of that? I didn't look up that one word. I think it stays with that word, comfort. How big is that little statement? They've been a comfort to me. I want to, this is one I want to challenge us in. And when you think about being with other beloved brethren in a small time or a big time, are you a comfort to them? You can use the word encouragement. That's really the same word. They, these three men were an encouragement to the apostle Paul. Did he really need it? You bet he did. You bet he did. You read biography after biography through the centuries and you see, did they need it? I had flashbacks of some of the friends that Whitfield had along the way. I had, I had memories of what Hudson Taylor, some of those men, some of those faithful ones he bonded with, and when they passed before him, what a loss it was. What a bond. You talk about blessed be the tie that binds. Hudson Taylor felt a loss that was magnificent in a good way. You don't understand what I'm saying, but those men, those, those relationships we see throughout the history of the church, those people are comforting each other. They're encouraging each other. They're building each other up. It is big. It is very big when Paul says that. They've been a comfort to me. I've had Mac be and help me through some of the hardest chapters of my life. I mean, you talk about somebody who was there. I can guarantee you that guy's all in towards me and towards the kingdom. I felt it. I know it. I mean, the, the, the ranks get pretty thin when it gets hard. Who's going to stand by you? Who are you going to call in to comfort you? you beloved, this, we want to be these kinds of people, and we want to be able to receive these kind of people. I don't want to just read about these men, close the book, and say, well, let's go outside and enjoy the leaves falling. We can do that, but there's something bigger that we're about. We're here for the kingdom of God, and we're here to build each other up. To be about the kingdom with each other and to speak in the truth and help each other. Oh man, these three brothers, they were right there with Paul, exhorting, strengthening, and comforting him. This is the guy that wrote a lot of the New Testament. I know. But we would say to Aristarchus, did you have some days where you did more speaking to Paul perhaps than he did? I would venture to say, yes. Aristarchus would say, well, there was a time perhaps when Mark and I were both there. And it was a hard stretch for Paul. He was getting a lot of pressures about the other churches and all. He was on the verge of writing this letter and we were with him and we did most of the talking. Could that have happened? It could have happened. Paul was giving and receiving. And these men were a comfort to him. Oh, beloved, that, that phrase right there would be great if it's a, a mark of your life and you knew how to comfort the brethren. They stood with Paul. We learned to stand with each other. As I said, think of what this might have looked like. Going in to visit Paul and ministering to his necessities in prison. I, I, was, I was capturing some of these notes or thoughts last night late, and it was, it was a little overwhelming. Can you imagine Paul in his physical frailty, his hurts, his needs. Can you imagine these men coming in and comforting him, him and just helping care for his physical needs? Maybe making him or bringing him some sort of a soup that would help him? Not a stack of new books, not all these other big things that we would admire and love, ministering right where he was. I shared what 
a few weeks ago when Linda got that infection in 2004 and Mac ended up having that first heart surgery. She, she couldn't be with him the whole time. And I was the last one with him that night before surgery, early the next morning. And it was, it was kind of surreal for he and I. And then I left Baylor Hospital and drove home. And there he was. And you, you think about, do you have a word in season? Are you, are you one of those that's born, a friend that's born for adversity, a brother that's there? Another picture, just, again, not trying to get too dramatic, but just trying to realize when he says they comforted me, they helped him, physical necessities. They shared in the fellowship, the fellowship of Christ together. <laughs> Mark wrote a book, a gospel. Paul wrote, I mean, we talk about men, you talk about fellowship. Fellowship in the truth the truths that the, the Spirit of God was with them and giving them in prison. Forget what else was going on in the Roman Empire. Something big was going on in that prison between those men. I mean, we're, we're talking about men that were turning the world upside down, and, and they were talking on these things. I mean, live, real, being given to them. So they would have shared in that fellowship together. Do you like just being with the brethren and, and just share it on the truth. Tom and I used to have some good drives to the prison years ago, Baker and I. We had, you, you have times where you're together and sometimes you come away from that car ride and you say, that was phenomenal. We left Cody and their home, what, about a year and a half ago. Mac and I came out, remember we came to y'all's house? And we drove out there and Mac and I being together and drove home, we were the happiest two guys in the county. Just because we enjoyed the time with them but we were enjoying each other. And sometimes Mac will cue up a topic on his mind. Does this sound like Mac, Linda? He said, you know, I want to I bring something up. I never know where we're going next. But it could be, it could be such a practical thing or it could be a, a big biblical thing that he, he's thinking through. And, but the point is, are we there together? Is there a fellowship we have in this comforting one another? Another way that we could look into these men's lives together. Can you imagine those men praying together? Paul, Aristarchus. Mark, whatever role justice had. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the Roman guards, whoever, hearing those men pray in the jail cell? I appreciated the heartbeat, the life, the reality of Brother Nick's prayer a while ago. But can you imagine praying with those men? Whew. Yes. You talk about comforting one another, praying together, praying for those churches, Aristarchus learning to pray and help Paul in that, comforting them. It's amazing, beloved. And lastly, just another consideration about comforting each other. Don't you know that they were men that exhorted and were being exhorted by Paul to run well in Christ Jesus? To run the race well. To keep running. They knew Paul was probably at the end. He was probably going to be getting out of that situation. It would be phenomenal to see Aristarchus leaving for a little time the cell going and doing other things, and what might have been said between those men, or Mark. You, you feeling any of this? You hear this? The reality? The, these aren't just some little verses. Oh yeah, these guys were with me. They worked kind of, they helped me out a little bit. Epaphras, he's a pretty good guy. You know, Luke, he was a physician. <laughs> As they say, sometimes a few words are saying volumes, big things. These men were a comfort to Paul. What about you and I? Would a, another Christian want you or I to join them in prison or during hard times? Can you be there for them? Can you bring a word in season? Can you be quiet when you need to? Can you love and weep with them when you need to? Can you pray with them? Would you be an encouragement? Would you or are you? Are you an encouragement to him? Are you a heavy or are you a... You bring words of life. You know what a heavy is? I, it drives me crazy in my business or my, my work through the years. The people that are heavies, whiners. You just wish there was a part of the building that just had a locked door. We're going to put the whiners in there today. And I'm going to get David Holslander. He's going to be my patrolman. I mean, he's going to just start taking the whiners out. And they, some of the younger staff look at me sometimes and they'll finally say, I know, I'm doing a lot of complaining. Yeah, <laughs> you are. We're going to figure this out. We're going to press on. But, you know, there's something about the reality of can you be an encourager? Beloved, learn to be, have a word in season, like some of the Proverbs, those beautiful Proverbs, to speak, to be able to help each other. Don't be a heavy. Be an encourager.
That's what Paul's companions did. Three men, three men that were very precious to Paul and therefore they should be precious to us. All of us should learn. Fellow servants, loyal Christian friends, true encouragers, comforters, speakers of the truth. Oh, beloved, these are so important in our life together, in the Christian community, near and across the world. Beloved, let's learn to be more of this to each other. These very truths by the grace of the Holy Spirit in us. He'll do it. We can learn more of this together. Lord, help us. Amen. Let me pray. Father, we, we rejoice again to behold in your word truths, these statements about these men. Lord, we know in the Old Testament and then in the book of Hebrews, there's these short statements about your servants of old and how you used them, what they lived for. Enoch walked with God. and Different ones, what Abel did. And now here we are with Aristarchus and Mark and Justice. And we thank you for them. Thank you, Lord, that how they ministered to Paul, they were so significant, so about the kingdom of our dear Savior and encouragers. Lord, work that in us. Refine us in these ways with each other, to love one another, to stimulate one another, to love and good deeds, and to, and to stand with each other, Lord, help us. Thank you, Lord. Blessed be your name through Christ. Amen.